I'm Sarah Titus and welcome to this week's Masterpiece Monday. I will be discussing Marcel Duchamp's Fountain uh, from 1917. And no, your eyes do not deceive you. This is indeed a urinal. Um, it is not a joke. Neither is um, the fact that I have chosen a piece called Fountain um, for this week, given the weather situation um, over the last few days. Um, but rather, this is the first work of sculpture that we are discussing. And um, while it may be a more unorthodox choice, especially in comparison to something more traditional, like uh, Michelangelo's Pietà, for example, um, I think this particular piece, Fountain, um, is uh, very important in that it holds a very important and sort of pivotal role uh, in the history of, of art, uh, in that it addresses or readdresses uh, the question, what is art? And subsequently, what is the role of the artist in the creation of art? Is it about process? Is it about idea? Is it about product? Um, is it some combination of all of those things? Um, and these are all questions uh, that the artists of the Dada movement, of which this piece um, is from, uh, were considering when they were creating um, their pieces um, and when they were creating their ideas for works of art. Um, so Dada was an international movement in both art, visual art and literature that used ridicule and nonsense to reflect the meaninglessness of the modern world, um, specifically after World War I. Dada artists were reacting to the disillusionment that was felt after the very brutal combat of World War I, which they called the, quote, insane spectacle of collective homicide, unquote. So obviously their feelings about World War I um, were very, very clear and obviously quite negative. Um, Dada had several centers about around the world, including New York City, Zurich, Paris, Berlin, and Cologne. Uh, as a movement, it began during World War I, 1915-1916, in Zurich, when three artists who were trying to escape the draft got together and performed at a local cabaret. Um, collectively, they were against everything. And as I mentioned, we're disillusioned by the war. I mean, if you know anything about World War I, initially, at least prior to actual combat, the war and the concept of war was greeted with optimism, enthusiasm. These grand ideas of heroism were based on um, an antiquated view of warfare. Um, and quickly, these ideas gave way to pessimism, cynicism, um, after the realities of modern warfare became clear, and as the body count began to rapidly go up. So as a group, um, these artists wanted to eliminate bourgeois society, who they saw as responsible for the atrocities in the war, um, to create a better life. And they wanted to do this through an examination of social and moral values. Uh, they believed that reason and logic were responsible for the war and that salvation was through political anarchy, essentially the opposite of these sort of entrenched political ideologies um, that brought people into conflict at the beginning of the war. Um, and so through political anarchy, through the irrational, the intuitive, these ideas of luck and chance, that was where um, salvation for society could be found. Um, and a large part of Dada is about spontaneity and relying on your intuition. Um, and this was paralleled in the work of Freud and Jung um, and the interpretation of dreams by Freud. He argued that the that unconscious and inner drives control human behavior. Um, and Dada saw art as sort of this practical means of self-revelation, a way to access that um, unconscious inner drive, right? So a lot of these images come from um, the subconscious and the unconscious. Hans Richter, who was a Dada filmmaker, um, expressed their sort of motivations um, in the following passage. He said, quote, possessed as we were of the ability to entrust ourselves to chance, to our conscious as well as our unconscious minds, we became a sort of public secret society. We laughed at everything, but laughter was only the expression of our new discoveries, not their essence and not their purpose. Pandemonium, destruction, anarchy, anti-everything of the world war. Who, which could have been anything but destructive, aggressive, insolent on principle, and with gusto, unquote. Um, so Richter, again, really draws that connection between the emergence of the Dada group um, and World War I. Um, so it really is a response to that particular moment in history and that global conflict. Um, 
As I mentioned, uh, artists were interested in the idea of chance and the total freedom of the individual. And because of that, and this idea of sort of political anarchy, each man for himself, do what you want, right? Go with your inner drives and with your with your gut, with your instincts. Um, by 1921, the movement fell apart because there was just no cohesion. There was no cooperation between the various centers around the world. And again, this was more of an idea than an identifiable particular style, something like impressionism or expression. Um, Andre Breton, who was the poet and theorist, who is the writer of the Surrealist Manifesto that I mentioned um, a few weeks ago in relationship with uh, to Frida Kahlo, um, said of the group, quote, Cubism was a school of painting, futurism a political movement, Dada is a state of mind, unquote. So I think you can see how um, it's, it's sort of a different, difficult um, ideology to perpetuate, at least through the visual medium. Um, in terms of the name Dada, uh, there's a little bit of uh, debate as to where that term actually came from. I mean, I think the intent is that obviously it's sort of a babyish sounding word. It's one of the first words that a lot of people say as, as infants. Um, and there's a sort of a level of um, sort of unsensical phonetics to it, right? Um, so they chose the term possibly randomly from a French German dictionary. Um, da in Romanian means guess or chance. Um, so, you know, any any number of beliefs as to the origin of the particular term. Um, like a lot of movements at this time, Dada artists did create a manifesto, um, just like the futurists, just like the surrealists. Um, and the manifesto says um, the following of sort of the motivations of Dada artists, quote, Dada knows everything, Dada spits on everything, Dada says no nothing. Dada has not fixed ideas. Dada does not catch flies. Dada is bitterness laughing at everything that has been accomplished, sanctified. Dada is never right. No more painters, no more writers, no more religions, no more royalists, no more anarchists, no more socialists, no more police, no more airplanes, no more urinary passages. Like everything in life, Dada is useless. Everything happens in a completely idiotic way. We are completely incapable of treating seriously any subject whatsoever, let alone this subject, ourselves, unquote. So I think you can see that the manifesto really, um, it doesn't present a clear picture of what their intent is, right? Except for to show that most things that we experience in life that we hold as important or have held, at least prior to World War I, um, are being re reimagined, they're being questioned as whether they are sort of the right way, the right thought process, the right political ideology. Um, because all of those things that had been in place before World War I ultimately culminated in this incredibly brutal conflict. So could they be the right way, right? Should they be sanctified? Um, and this is sort of the, um, you know, and this, these ideas are kind of paralytic in some respects, because how do you move forward, right? Well, maybe you end up producing something that looks like a urinal, or in fact, is a urinal, right? Um, so turning to um, Duchamp's fountain, I think this piece perfectly sums up everything I just said in that manifesto, right? It is nonsensical at first glance, right? Um, this is a photograph of the original, which is now lost. Um, Luckily, we have the photograph um, that was uh, taken by Alfred Stieglitz, who is the, the famed photographer and husband of Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, and this is a photograph of it in its original um, exhibition, um, which was for the Society of Independent Artists exhibit at the um, 291 Art Gallery. Um, so it is a urinal. It's a standard urinal. The urinal itself was not actually made by Duchamp. It was ready-made, right, or already made. We'll come back to the uh, that term and the meaning of that term. Um, but it was laid on its back, flat on its back, rather than in its sort of upright, usual position mounted on a wall, right? Um, and then you can see in the lower left-hand corner, it's signed R. Mutt 1917. Now, obviously, Duchamp is the artist here, right? So then that begs the question of who is R. Mutt, right? Um, so this type of art, as I mentioned, is called a ready-made, um, which is an ordinary manufactured object designated by the artist as a work of art. So Again, kind of if we're going to bring into question 
all of the institutions um, that are, you know, that, that are a part of society, why not also call into question our understanding of art? OK, um, so if art historically meant large history paintings, mythological subjects, nudes, right, um, an exploration of the human body, this is offering something different. OK, because, again, all of that led us to this sort of in Spain spectacle of collective homicide. Right. Um, so now let's take this in a different direction. OK, so really this fountain, which obviously is a urinal, epitomizes the assault on convention and good taste by designating such a lowly object as a work of art and exhibiting it as a work of art. It's um, in the photograph, you can see it. Um, it's displayed on a, on a pedestal, right? What What is put on pedestals, things that we admire and that are meant to be admired, right? Um, and behind it is a painting by the artist Marsden Hartley. Um, so again, like it becomes something that we otherwise would not see it as, which is an object to be admired, considered, right? Um, so where did the idea come from? The idea came from a discussion between the artist Duchamp, the American collector, Walter Arnisberg, and the another artist named Joseph Stella. Um, so in response to this discussion, Duchamp purchased this journal from a plumber's merchant and submitted it to this exhibition organized by the Society of Independent Artists. So he purchased something that someone else made, mass produced, and Sort of submitted it for consideration, okay, for this exhibition. The board of directors of the Society of Independent Artists, uh, they were bound by the constitution of the society to accept all submissions, um, all members' submissions to this particular exhibition. Um, however, they took exception to the fountain and they refused to exhibit it. Um, Duchamp and Arnisberg, who were both on the board, they resigned immediately in protest, obviously, because this went against the, um, the ideals of the group, but also sort of the stated regulations for exhibition. Um, so in an article published contemporary to um, the exhibit, and it was thought to have potentially been written by Duchamp, claim the following, quote, Mr. Mutt's fountain is not immoral. That is absurd. No more than a bathtub is immoral. It is a fixture that you see every day in a plumber's shop windows. Whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain has no importance. He chose it. He took an ordinary article of life, placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view, created a new thought for that object, unquote. So I think that through this, you can see some of the claims or the excuses, I suppose, that other board members of the Society of Independent Artists used to exclude this particular piece from the exhibit. Um, first, right, is that it is immoral right? Because it represents something that is meant for people to urinate in. It normally um, occupies a private space, a men's restroom or a restroom, right? Um, and is a representation of a sort of a physical manifestation of what is otherwise um, an activity that takes place in private, right? Not one meant to be discussed at the beginning of the 20th century in public or sort of any allusion to it, right? Um, additionally, uh, the board definitely took an issue with the fact that this was a ready-made, right? It, again, it brings into question, what is the role of the artist? What is the function of the artist? Is it about idea or is it about process, right? Um, and then finally, what is this, right? I mean, he doesn't call it urinal. He calls it fountain, right? It is something that squirts out water, right? Um, and so as a result, he's, you know, Duchamp sort of playfully changes the function um, of the of the piece to create potentially something new, just simply by removing it from its context, removing it from its wall, and changing its orientation, right? Um, so all of these things, you know, initially um, uh, caused a lot of consternation for the board. But now, since then, um, various other examples of the Duchamp's fountain have been displayed around the world. Um, so later in life, Duchamp commented on the alter, uh, the name of the alter ego, Armut, that he created for this work. He said, quote, Mutt comes from Mott Works, the name of a large sanitary equipment manufacturer. But Mott was too close, so I altered it to Mutt. 
So there is some sort of manipulation happening there. After the daily cartoon strip, Mutt and Jeff, which appeared at the time and with which everyone was familiar. Thus, from the start, there was an interplay of Mutt, a fat little funny man, and Jeff, a tall thin man. I wanted an old, any old name, and I added French, which is French slang for money bags. So, um, unquote. So this is, you know, Duchamp's uh, attempt to explain the name and why he didn't just put his own name on there. He created sort of a persona, right? Um, so while this piece is is somewhat unorthodox, I suppose, um, for uh, especially this trajectory that we have been going on in this series, um, I hope that at least through that examination, um, you can sort of take away the importance of this particular piece um, as a um, sort of instigator, or to use a term that is commonly used today, sort of a disruptor, um, when it comes to um, the, the question and the answer to the question, what is art and what is the role of the artist in producing art? So thank you so much for listening. If you have um, questions or recommendations for pieces that you would like um, me to discuss in the future, uh, you may respond to this post on Facebook, um, or you can go to um, uh, email and email me at cccmasterpiecemondays at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.